Good morning. Good Chicles, the country church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good morning. Feels good. We have one less person on the on the platform today. That's kind of good. You know, don't go on. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't go away. You don't have to put up with it. <clears throat> if you take your Bible and turn to First John, the first chapter, easiest way to get there is to go to the Book of the Revelation and take a quick left, and you'll be there fast. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 John 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it means to us, for the life it provides for us. We thank you for the reminder that if we come to you and confess our sins, Lord, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And that is such a precious verse in our lives, and we thank you for it. Lord, I pray for our worship time now. pray for Dave, our praise team, our instrumentalist, as they lead us to worship you. We pray you would be glorified. Lord, we pray for John as he'll come to proclaim your word. I pray you would anoint him and he would be your mouthpiece today. Father, help us to be obedient in responding to your word, and we'll give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Turn to four or five people. Tell them your first name so they'll know who they're worshiping with today. Pastor, if that didn't do something for you, your firewood's wet. <laughs> if you've got a Bible, you should grab it and turn to 1 John chapter 1. Today what I want to do, oh, that just got loud quick. Today what I want to do is I want to just want to walk with you through a passage of Scripture, 1 John 1 through really 1 John 2, verse 2. Let me just give you some background before we read. <clears throat> Peter loved Jesus. And Peter wanted to be the closest person that Jesus knew. But Jesus had three who wanted to be close to him, Peter, James, and John. And at the end of the ministry of the life of Jesus on earth, if you remember, they were <clears throat> out on the ocean and, and Jesus appeared and they all came in, but Peter couldn't wait. He took off his cloak, took off his outer cloak, jumped in the water and swam to shore, um, skirting the nets and bringing them in. That's, I probably would have done that too. That sounded like a good idea. 
But they get on shore, and then Peter is restored by Jesus. Remember, the, the, he asked him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? At the end of their time, Peter wanted to know one thing. <clears throat> what about John? What about John? You see, Peter knew John had a special, intimate relationship with Jesus. We know that when they were doing the Lord's Supper even, that Jesus and John were beside each other and were resting head on in the lap. John had an incredible relationship with Jesus. He was called, uh, rightly by his name, the Beloved One. The book of John then tells the gospel of Jesus through the eyes of love because that's what John was about. This book, 1 John, is really written for the purpose of you and I understanding how to pursue that kind of relationship with Jesus. So let me just start by saying this morning, I don't know what your relationship with Jesus looks like. But I want to tell you today, you can have a relationship with the Lord like a, son, like a favored son would have with his father. You might not know what that feels like. I do. <laughs> With my mother. <laughs> There's just something about being knowing that you're loved. And if you don't hear anything else today, this is even part of the sermon. I want you to hear something. You are a loved people. God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. God has no desire for you to spend eternity without Him but died so that you'd see the truth. Today, if you've got a Bible and you're there, would you stand with me as we read? We're going to read it again from front to beginning, from the beginning to the end. I'm going to read it from my phone because I can. 1 John chapter 1 what was from the beginning, what we heard, that which we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all of our sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just forgive us, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him to be a liar and His words are not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not just for ours but also for those of the whole world. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have a desire and you are seeking out to have a relationship with us. And not just a relationship, a one-time salvation, but Father, an everyday type of relationship where we walk in fellowship with you. Father, I pray that today you would call people to yourself and that you'd help me get out of the way. Father, forgive me of my sins so that today I can be a vessel who is rightly used by you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I, I'm, uh, you know, since I'm using my phone, you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll put it on silent. Anybody know how to do that? Here, check your phone and see if you know how, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> if somebody's phone goes off, I'm going to laugh, and we're going to have a hard time. All right. We're just going to kind of walk through this today because I really just want you to see um, really what I saw. I, I'm studying this. If you wonder how in the world do you pick these things, I'm going back to Madagascar November the 13th for nine days with Brad Babel and Craig Bednors, two of, your, two of your members that we're going, they're going with me to kind of 
see what we're doing, and, and we're going to be participating. They're going to be two days on the street sharing the gospel uh, to people who don't speak English. It's going to be awesome. Um, they'll have translators, don't worry. But I'm preparing because for two days I'm going to be teaching seminary classes and walking through the book of First John with probably more than 60 leaders who uh, three years ago didn't know Jesus. And so um, it's going to be an amazing, amazing time. But as I'm studying through this, that's why I decided not to double dip. I just, I mean, I decided to double dip. Just go ahead and, and teach you what I'm learning as I'm walking through First John. And so first and foremost, I want you to remember this is written by John, the beloved one. The one who knew what intimacy with the, with the Savior looked like. You know, in our world, in our generation, people want you to believe that a love between a man and a man it has to be perverted. Did you hear me? What Jesus and John had was a godly love for one another, but not a perverted love that the world would like you to buy into. Listen, people who are lost act lost. I get that. But I want you to understand, there is needed in our church men who have love for men. And there's a need in our church for women to, have, to, to really love other women. And we can't be afraid of it just because the world wants to redefine it. Because God defined it first. So let's look at this verse. Verses 1 through 4 I want to look at as a group. I want to read it again to you. If nothing else, you'll have heard these verses four or five times. Maybe they'll sink in. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we've seen with our own eyes, what we've looked at and touched at with our own hands concerning the word of life. Literally, he says, look, this isn't something we made up on the fly. These aren't something we're passing down second and third generation. These are things we saw and we were a part of. Concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested to us. In other words, the life, that word of life was revealed in whom? In Jesus. And we've seen and testify and proclaim to you the, not, we don't, we don't proclaim to eternal life. We proclaim to you the eternal life. Because life is found in no one else. You see, your life on this, on this world, on this, on this planet, is going to cease. Some of you sooner than later. Because some of you are like 18 and sick. Just kidding. The idea is, is that we're all perishing. All of us. But Jesus said, in me you can find eternal life which was with the Father and was shown or manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus. And these things we write to you so that our joy may be made complete. You know, I like having a good friend. And having a good friend is, is you know, you can do that. You have something in common. You can, but you know when you add another person to the equation, there's more to fight about. And the more people you add, you just add more problems. So you know what's best is just have a couple of friends. That's what the devil wants you to hear. Because watch this. What's great about this relationship that, that God's talking about through, the, through John is he's saying, look, I can have fellowship with you if you're fellowshipping with Jesus because he's fellowshipping with God and we have something in common to talk about. See, unfortunately, most of the time, churches find something in common to fight about. And if we can't fight the world, we'll just fight each other. Why is, why is it that so many churches um, who, who are teaching hatred on the streets, they have these signs that homosexuals, you guys, God hates you. By the way, that ain't true. Amen? Huh. If God hates uh, homosexuals, then he hates all of us. Because all of us are perverted in some way, shape, or form. All of us have gone our own way in some way, shape, or form. And homosexuality is no different than any other sin in the Bible. So if you're a little overweight, stop griping about homosexuals. That was free. That wasn't even, I didn't, that's not even in my notes. I'll show them to you later. My point is this. God wants us to have a relationship with Him, but here's what happens. If we can't find something to fight, about, fight the world about, we'll start fighting each other. You know, we have an enemy. And, and he's alive and well, but he's not in fleshly form. He's not one you can see. So stop killing the ones you can see and start fighting the one you can't. 
All right, that's all free. So 1 John 1 through 4 says, We proclaim these things to you that we've seen. Why? So that you can be made full. It's unfortunate to me that normally the church looks like the fool instead of being made full, complete. F-O-O-L versus F-U-L-L. And so you and I need to get to a point where we have something in common to talk about. And listen, here's what we need to talk about. There is good news for people. Jesus died for sinners of which I was the chief. And just in case you thought I was just about Paul, that's about you and me too. We're all chief in our own, in our own right about our own sin. Nobody does your sin better than you. So verse 1 through 4 fires me up. Gets me excited because we have something to talk about. Verse 5 says, okay, what is this message we can fire up about? Here's the message. God is light and in Him there is a little bit of darkness. <clears throat> oh, that's not what it says. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. You know, that's hard to even understand. You, you know, in this room, you can get a room pretty, pretty bright. But no matter how bright you get the room, there's always going to find shadows. You know why? Because something always gets in the way of the direct light. Did you know, this is, this is interesting to me. I was, I was reading this this week. If you were looking into a dark chasm where there's nothing there, just darkness, and the sun was shining behind you, did you know that if you were looking this way into a dark chasm and the sun was shining bright behind you, you would not even see at all the sun? It would look dark as it could be? It would be dark as night if you were looking into a dark chasm and the sun was shining behind you. The only way you'll see it is to either, one, turn around, which, by the way, is the, is the definition of repentance, or for something else to be in front of you so that the sun can reflect so that then your eyes can pick up the light. You know, church, that's what we're supposed to be. People have their faces away from God and we're supposed to be the reflectors. I'll never forget going on a, on a, 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 a ferry. Well, they're not really ferries in Madagascar, but you put your truck on a couple buckets and they go across the river. <laughs> that is the truth. Don't worry, Brad, you're going to see it. Um, <laughs> your prayer life will be up to date, buddy. So as you go across, it was dark as night. I mean, it was like 2 in the morning. There, were no, there was no electricity. There was no, and we're going across, and they are flying. I mean, this one actually had a motor, and they are flying across this thing. And I'm thinking, we could hit all kinds. What are you doing? And all of a sudden, they zip, and they stop it, and they let you out. And, and I was amazed. I said, how in the world did you know where the shore was? I can't see anything. He said, well, look right up there. What am I looking at? That's dark too. He said, no, 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 look. Right there it's really dark, and right above it it's a little not as dark. <laughs> and it's amazing when he said that, I, I saw it. I didn't see it before. I said, what is it? He said, that's the tree line. He said, we drive until we reach the tree line, and then we stop because we know we've arrived. You know, people who live in darkness, even a little light makes all the difference. It's amazing to me that God can use really dumb Christians like me to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to people. Because I think to myself, but man, my life is so screwed up. And God goes, I don't need you to be really, I don't need you to be completely righteous. I already did that. I just need you to be available. I just need you to reflect something for a while. Can you do that? So here he says, God is different than you because in him there's no darkness. Did you know, let me tell you one more thing about light. I think this is awesome too. If you take light into a room and there's nothing in the way, there'd be no shadows. But what causes shadows is when something gets in the way of the light. You know, a lot of times uh, the reason people that you know don't come to Christ is because you got in the way. You're trying to be a reflector, but watch this. Reflectors can't be between God and them. That's Jesus' job because he's the light. Reflectors have to be on the other side. You have to get out of God's way and let God do his work. Some of you parents are working so hard to save your, you save your, 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 uh, your children who are grown. Some of you just need to get out of his way. 
Some of you need to trust God and say, you're the light, I'm not. Let me be a reflector in the background and you do your work. But watch this. Here's the, cool, here's the really cool thing. I always say that, that non-Christians don't hate Christians. They hate hypocrites. And the problem with us is we, don't, we just don't say we're hypocrites. We just lie. Well, I'm trying. Well, yeah, but you're still a hypocrite. I think we should all, this should be like Hypocrites Anonymous. We should all introduce ourselves and say, Hi, I'm John and I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> Anybody not a hypocrite, please stand. We'd like to worship you. <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Listen to me. Here's the cool thing about light and darkness. Did you know if you put something transparent between a light and the floor, it doesn't cast a shadow? Transparent things don't cause shadows. Transparent things don't get in the way. And if you and I would just be more transparent to a dying world, they'd realize that we're not the Savior. We're reflectors who don't want to get in His way. And so in Him, there is zero darkness. Isaiah 59, 1 through 3 teaches that your sin separates you from God. It's amazing to me that that, that was something taught way back when. Your sin separates you. That's the reason you need a priest. That's the reason they looked to, to the priest to pray for them. That's the reason Jesus became your high priest who died for you. So that the high priest who would die for your sins, then you could call him your Lord and then be forgiven. So sin separates. John 12, written by the same man in John, Jesus speaking says this. Jesus says, I am the light and that he walks in light. Verse 35 then of John 12 says, Walk in light so that darkness will not overtake you. Listen to me. Way too often Christians get overtaken by depression. They get over, overtaken by um, sickness. They get overtaken by um, all kinds of things that the devil throws at us. The Bible promises here, if you walk in light, you will not be overtaken. By the darkness. And so there's this process by which we have to walk in light. Let's go on. Verse 36 of John 12 says, While you have the light, Jesus is speaking of himself because he said he was the light. He says, While you have the light, live in the light. Walk in the light. And then he says, and not just walk and live with it, but believe in it. You know what you can attribute light to where you can say it is? Light is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. He is the truth. And so when we walk as He walked, and as we walk in His, in His we, see this is going to sound wrong now, in His shadow, when we walk like He walked, when we walk according to Him, in fellowship with Him, then it says, and don't just walk with Him, but believe in Him. Believe in the truth. Now watch this. I tell my children all the time, if you would just tell me the truth, the consequences would be less. How many of you have told your kids that? Keep your hand up if they believed you. <laughs> I, you know what? Because what their minds think is it might be less, but I might can get away with this. Amen? You know, that's the reason a lot of us don't confess our sins to God either. Because we think, well, I'm not sure it was sin, so I just won't mention it and I'll get away. You ain't getting away with nothing. Your sin separates. And so here he says, while you have the truth, while you have the life, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, walk with me, believe in me. John 1, 6 through 8, Jesus, uh, John is speaking about John the Baptist. He says that John the Baptist came as a testimony to the light so that all men might believe in the light, but he himself was not the light. And so all along, they're looking for some light to show up. And then Jesus declares in John 12, he was the light they were always looking for. And then John 12, 44 through 46 says, those who believe in me will not remain in darkness. Can I just stop there for a minute and just tell you? It doesn't say those who believe in me will never have darkness. It says you won't stay there. You know, we... um. We, you know we used to live in Madagascar, but I don't live there anymore. I live in Marion, Texas. No, that's not true. I live in New Braunfels, Texas. Seems like I live here, though. I can tell people I live there all I want to, but a lot of things are true. Number one, I've gained 35 pounds, so they know I don't live there. <laughs> 
Number two, I have internet so they know I'm not there. So there's this idea, I can go back and visit, but I don't live there anymore. You know, when I gave my life to Jesus, what I said to him is, I no longer live. I want you now to live in me. And the life I now live, I'll live by faith. Now, does that mean I never visit sin? Man, I wish it meant that. I pray for the day where I stop visiting some of those sins. But you know what I'm really thankful for? I'm really thankful that when I come over here and visit, whether it be on purpose or on accident, I'm thankful that while I'm visiting, the Lord makes me miserable over here. Until I'm like, how come, pastor says it all the time, how come this ain't fun no more? Well, it's because it's not my house no more. And so those who are in the light, in the truth, they cannot, they will not remain in sin. And so then he says to them in, in, in John 12, he says, so he does all this so that you might become sons of light. Sons of light, what does that mean? Sons of truth. People who were identified by what they do. You know, in Madagascar, they, when, when you lead someone to Jesus, we should do this in America too, by the way, when they lead someone to Jesus, they immediately call you their son. Um, Simon Peter, who's the pastor in, in Fanuevu in one of, the, one of the villages, first time I met him, I'd never met him before, he introduced me to his congregation as his great-grandfather. Actually, I'm sorry, his grandfather. Uh, I, that was a weird thing for me. Grand, he's 65, I'm 45, and I'm his grandfather. And, and then he explained how Radu had led him to the Lord, and I had really discipled Radu, so that made him, me his grandfather. That's a weird thing. But you know, whether you like it or not, you're identified by what you do too. Somebody says, hey, do you know, do you know Brad? Brad, who's Brad? You know the pool guy. Oh, I know Brad. Because Brad's the pool guy. You know JK? JK who? You know, the guy at church that takes care of uh, mean people. You know, because they just got to get the meaner person to take care of the mean people. <laughs> Somebody says, hey, do you know uh, Jim Watson? Who? You know Doc. Oh, I know Doc. We, whether you know it or not, you, people identify you by what they know you for. And this says that if you will walk in light, God will start identifying you as sons of light. Sons of truth, sons of light. And so there's this, there's this thing that you and I have to come to the fact that if God is light and there is no darkness in Him, we at least have to desire for there to be no darkness in us too. Verse 6. Fellowship with Him does not happen in darkness. Man, I love this. Uh, um, I'm going to pull the verse up exactly because I want to read it to you. If we say we have fellowship with Him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie. And we don't, it doesn't just say we just lie, it says we lie and we don't practice truth. You know why most of you sin? Actually, you know why all of you sin? Because you've practiced a long time. I mean, it's pretty normal these days. You know, practice makes, <laughs> some of y'all are perfect at your sin. I know I am, I'm just saying. So here it says, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie. Uh, you know, listen to me. I, I want to speak directly to some people today that I don't even know, I, nobody directly to you like I know what's going on in your life, but I want to speak directly to some sin. Can I do that for a sec? I don't care if you say yes, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> if you're married today to, to someone who desires to stay with you, you need to stay. And somebody said, well, he's beating me. Well, then get out, but don't leave him. Does that make sense? Get away from difficult situations, but divorce is not God's answer. Somebody says, well, it might be. Yes, you're right, because the Bible says if you have a hardened heart, God allows divorce. But you better at least agree that you have a hard heart. Now, some of you say, John, this is too hard a teaching. That's okay. It's straight from God's Word. We have to deal with God's Word. I am tired of... I'm not even the senior pastor, and I am tired of people coming to me with marriage difficulty. It, there's always one of them who says, I'm done. And I want to ask this question. I, I really should just do this. When they say, I'm done, I should say, if we say that we have fellowship with him, Jesus, and yet we decide we want to walk in darkness, you're a liar. Hello? Hello? And for those that go, well, like, thank God I ain't got no marriage issues. Would you like me to get your sin? <laughs> Here's the key. 
There is no reason for us to walk in sin ever again. If we do it, it's because we have hardened hearts. Because God has not called you into darkness. He's called you out of darkness into light. I'm going to talk about Ephesians 5 later, but Ephesians says, you once were in darkness, but now you are children of light, so act like it. You know, there's probably nothing worth, worse, though, than being in a marriage that's legal, but not intimate. You know, that's the reason there's such difficulty. And unfortunately, a lot of us live on our relationship with Jesus like that. Well, I know I'm God's child, but I'm not. Or, or here's what I hear all the time from. It's funny that Catholics are probably the most honest people I know. They'll tell you in a heartbeat, I'm a Catholic, but I'm not practicing. Anybody know people like that? You, you ain't got the guess. Just ask them. Hey, are you a Catholic? Yeah, but I'm not practicing. It's like they know how to say it. I wish, I wish y'all would do that. Hey, are you coming Wednesday night? Well, I would, but I'm not practicing. <laughs> hey, are you coming to men's time this Saturday? Ah, oh, I would, but I'm a Christian, but I'm not. I'm only practicing Sundays. I wish we were just honest, transparent, because you remember transparent people don't, don't get in the way of the God's light. I wish we'd just be honest about who we are. And so here it says that we're supposed to walk in light as he is in the light. This week I was walking, uh, I was getting out of my bed and, and I had to go to the bathroom. It's interesting that I was just starting studying for the sermon. It was Monday night and, and it was really late and I had to go to the bathroom. So I got up and I wanted to turn the light on because I, I was just studying these passages. And I was like, I need to turn the light on. I'm going I'm to hurt myself tonight. God's going to use this as an example on Sunday morning. I know this. But I didn't want to disturb my wife who was sleeping. So I left the light on. Off. Walked to the bathroom. I got all the way to the bathroom. I thought, I, I've got it in the maid, maid in the shade now. And as I took a step, my leg hit the laundry basket who my wife left in front of the door. I'm guessing to tell me I was supposed to full close. <laughs> and so I don't know if you guys are athletic enough to do this. I'm still athletic enough to hurt myself. I threw my leg up. When I hit the top of it, I thought of jumping over it. Well, I jumped over the first part. My leg caught the back part. I fell on my face, and my back went, and, I, oh, and it's still killing me. And I thought, who in the world puts a basket in front of the door? And it's like the Lord goes, who doesn't turn on the light after I give them God's word? <laughs> You're about to preach a whole sermon on this, John. And I literally, I'm telling you, me and the Lord had a conversation. I said, but I didn't want to disturb my wife. And the Lord said, well, then you deserve to get hurt. <laughs> you think your wife's in bed going, I hope he gets hurt. I hope not. Was that the case? Okay. And then I asked my wife a question, even this morning. I said, I wonder if God were in the bed with me. And I had to go to the bathroom. And I said, hey, let's go to the bathroom. You think God would be afraid of what's... You think he's afraid of the dark, first of all? You know, this week I was leaving that building over there. And I had to turn all the lights out. And I turned all the lights out. And when I turned them all out, dude, it was dark. And a fear came on. I'm afraid of church. I don't know why I'm so afraid of churches. But church buildings scare me. We used to play hide and seek at Lazy Brook. It I wanted to be found. They'd be like, John, why are you always first to get caught? Because I'm scared. <laughs> and I've tried to wonder for years, why am I so afraid of the church building? I'll tell you why, because there are more demons here than out there. I'm not talking about you. I'm not, listen, I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be funny now. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about, if you think the evil spirits don't show up more often than you, you are completely deceived. I feel them here. Every time I try to do something here, I feel demonic things just going, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. I don't want that. You don't feel it? This today, during the invitation time, you just ask the Lord to show it to you. Because I can promise you the demon's going to speak to every person here who needs to make a decision to follow Christ. He's going to go, not today. Not today. You've got tomorrow. Others, others are, God's going to say, you need to go pray and commit this to me. And he's going to say, don't do that today. People are going to look at you. God's going to say, you need to go tell the pastor what's going on in your life. And they're going to say, if you go up there, people are going to talk about you. 
The demons reside here. This isn't God's house because he lives here. It's God's house because you showed up today. Where two or three are gathered. You used to meet in a bar and that was a holy place on Sunday morning. <laughs> that was the only time. But you and I are not supposed to walk in darkness. We're not supposed to be even about the darkness. But when I walked to the bathroom, I thought to myself, would the Lord have walked in the dark with me and said, well, John, watch out for that basket coming up. And the answer is no. Not because he would have tripped himself, but because he has a rule. His rule is he doesn't walk in darkness. You and I need to have more rules in our life. Why don't you do what you do? I'll tell you why, because I have a rule in my life. I know what I can handle and what I can't handle, so I'm not going to walk down that road. You Listen, you want to go to the bar and share Jesus with somebody? Invite me. I got no problem with bars. Never drank in my life, have no struggle with that stuff. But I guarantee you there's something in the bar that could get me if I just relax for a moment. So, all of us have struggles. All of us need to know what they are. And some of us just need to make rules and I'm going to go, you know, I'm done with that. Because that's darkness in my life. Let me go on because we're going to be here all day otherwise. The problem with, with walking in darkness is that we think we know how to, how to operate in the darkness because it's our house. But you know the enemy or your wife. I didn't say and, I said or, chill. The enemy will put something in your path that's not supposed to be there. We think we can maneuver through darkness. The God doesn't say, walk, tread lightly through darkness. He says, stay out of darkness. Turn the light on. All right, let's go on. Verse 7. Oh, I've got I to say this quote. God uses His Word then to illuminate sin in our lives. So that the traps of sin will not cause us to stumble and fall in darkness. Some of us, we're not reading God's Word, so we have no idea what sin is because it's not being illuminated through His Word. Some of you are like, well, you know, I've really conquered the big sins in my life. Well, what are the little ones? Because listen, have you, have you ever taken a little, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I started collecting pennies and stuff when I was a little kid. And in one year I collected $50 and we put it in the bank. And my mom was like, how'd you get all that money? Well, I collected as much as I could, as, as much as I could all the time, little bit by little bit by little bit. You know, a lot of a, lot of a little bit ends up being a lot. And so... God wants to illuminate. He wants to shed light on the situation of your life so that you can see what really is sin. Some of you are like, well, I'm not, I'm not sinning. Well, we're going to get there in just, so, in just a moment. Verse 7 says, we start some if-then statements. If we walk in light as He Himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. Why is it you and I have a problem fellowshipping with one another? It's because we walk in darkness. If you and I would take care of the sin in our life, you and I would have nothing to fight about. We would be teammates to fight something else. But the devil never wants that to be true. So he makes sure that you and I have something to fight about. He makes sure that, that you, you think you are so godly that you can walk in the little darkness and maneuver the situation because that's how godly you really are. Notice this. I love this. The Bible doesn't say, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we will not sin. It doesn't say that. There is a given here. Whether you walk in light or walk in darkness, you are going to sin. So, let me tell you one of the reasons that's true. Because the word sin means to miss God's mark. I remember one time I told some youth, I said, let's try to be perfect today. Let's try to live sinless life. The Bible says we can do it. Let's try it. So all day long, I went around singing worship songs. Somebody tried to talk to me. I go, nope, uh-uh. And I'd sing a song because I didn't want to be mad. I didn't want to be angry. And I just sang. And I was sitting at a table, and there was a lady who worked there, and she was cleaning a table. And, and I really felt like you should get up and go help her. And I was like, no, uh-uh. I'm singing. And God goes, see, that's sin. <sighs> you see, the closer we get to God, the more he reveals things in our life that we never thought were sin. Because his word then can illuminate little things because you finally got over what you consider big things. They're the same to him. So we have fellowship with him. And then, and then it says, and he cleanses us from how much sin? From all our sins. So if we walk in his light, he's promised to forgive you all of your sins. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. I already read some. I already said some of it to you. Um, but it says, to you, once we're darkness, now you're light in the Lord. So live like that. 
having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what disobedient people do in secret. But find out what pleases God. And everything that is, you expose everything with the light, because the light makes all things visible. That's why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. You want God to shine through your life? You want to be a transparent vessel that God can shine through? You want to be a reflector so that people can see Jesus in you? Here's how you do it. you got to walk with Jesus and ask Him to illuminate the things in your life that don't honor Him. I want to show you a, uh, a quick clip before we go on. It doesn't matter how much you prepare for something, the devil going, well, you can't use that one. Let me tell you what you couldn't see and probably why the demons don't want you to see it. He says, why does the floor move? He then takes a torch, he throws it down, and there are snakes everywhere. I wanted you to see it because it's one thing to say there's a bunch of snakes, but they give you a close-up of all the snakes on top of snakes, on top of snakes, on top of snakes. 7,000 of them. Actually, sorry, 9,000 of them. They had a thousand, it wasn't enough. They put another thousand, it wasn't enough. They added seven thousand where there were nine thousand snakes on that floor. And and literally he rolls over and he goes, Snakes, why did it have to be snakes? I'll tell you why. Because the enemy knows what you don't like, and that's what he's gonna throw at you. But why in the world, why in the world did he throw the torch? He threw the torch because he was wise enough to say, Let me see what I'm getting myself into. You and I need to understand some, some principles here. The principle is, if, if God gets involved in your life, He's going to show you some things that should scare you. He's going to show you some things that He's not honored with. But then you're responsible for doing something about it. All right, let's go on because it, it gets closer. It gets better here. He says, um, oh, let me, let me tell you one statement I wrote. If God were to show you all of the sins in your life at the same time, it would scare you away from Him. Some of you are like, God, just, just show me where I'm displeasing to you. And he shows you one thing. And you're like, sweet, just one? No, that's the only one you can handle. If we were to show you all of them, you'd be like, I quit. Aren't you glad he sees them all and doesn't quit on you? If we say then we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. See, what the devil wants you to do is the devil wants you to go, well, you know what? I ain't got no sin. Okay, well, guess what? You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. None of you, I don't care how godly you are, are without sin. You all have sin. There is no room for truth and lies in you. You can't have both. If God's truth is in you, you're going to agree with Him. If you don't agree with Him, then you're the liar. And so, we all sin. If you're convinced that you've not sinned, then His truth hasn't taken up residence. He doesn't live here. If you're okay with sin... God doesn't live here. If somebody says, well, I'm really struggling with homosexuality. You know, I'm dealing with, I'm going to deal with all this, by the way. Somebody says, I'm really struggling with homosexuality. You know, God might live in you. You know why? Because you're struggling with it. It's when you say, I don't care what God thinks. I'm going to do my own thing. It's when you've proven that who, what? God doesn't live in you. Now, I love the fact that everybody wants to jump down some homosexual, right? Watch this. If you know alcohol, you know you're getting drunk and you're just okay with it, God doesn't live in you. If you know your mouth is an issue, but you don't care, then God doesn't live in you. If you say, well, I know I'm, I know I'm fat, and I know I, I eat too much, but I don't care, that's a sign that God don't live in you. Because God is not okay with sin. You need to be strugglers with me. I'm not okay with eating too much. I, man, I, I, I still fail every day. But nothing in me ever goes, it's okay to be fat. It, uh, never does that come up. 
I, I yell at my children. I mean, I yell at them. I, it, it is a re- that's something you need to pray about for me, with me. I get tired of yelling at them. But you know, it ain't until I yell that they do anything. And I'm tired of whipping them. But watch this. When I do it, I don't go, yeah, that's what they deserve. The minute I do it, I mean the second I do it, I feel defeated. Because I know it's wrong. And then I struggle with, okay, how do I make it right? See, that's proof that Jesus lives in me. Because, you know, I used to yell and I didn't care. I used to like, you know, different girls. and It didn't bother me. But when I gave my life to Jesus, things that were sin started bothering me. And at some point, you and I have to come to truth. And the truth is, if I can live in sin and I'm okay with it, there's a problem because the Spirit of God can't let you be okay with it if He lives here. Verse 9 then, oh, love this. Verse 9 says here another if then. If we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Which sins are we confessing? Well, be careful. It doesn't say that. If we confess our sins, it doesn't say all of our sins. I just want to make sure you catch what it says and what it doesn't say. You see, the, the verses before seem to say, well, they do say, when you spend time with God, He shows you some stuff. He illuminates things in you. I've already said to you, I believe throughout Scripture it says that if God were to show you everything, you'd quit. You know what sins you're supposed to confess? The ones that He illuminates to you. The ones that He says, John, that is not okay. And then I confess that. And then if I don't know what to confess, then I ask the Lord, okay, Lord, can you illuminate some more in my life? And I confess the ones He illuminates, the ones He sheds light on. And if I'll be faithful to confess the ones He's illuminated in my life, then He's faithful and just to forgive me of the sins I don't know anything about. Amen? See, if you had to confess all your sins to be forgiven all your sins, we'd all go to hell. Because there's a lot of sins, a lot of failings, a lot of mis misdoing what God wants that you have no idea about. And some of you will never know about because God's got bigger plans. He's forgiving you of things you know nothing about and telling you you need to do something about this one. And so you need to be faithful with, with asking God or confessing your sins to God, the ones that He has illuminated in your life. Why would God do that? Because He desperately desires fellowship with His children. Verse 10, if we say we've not sinned, then we make him to be a liar. He goes even further than he did before. It isn't just that you're a liar. If you say, man, I, I've taken care of all my sin. Not only, are you saying, not only are you a liar, you're saying to God you're a liar. Watch this. If, if we make him out to be a liar, then we know this, that his word doesn't, is not in us. And then we get to the good news. 1 John chapter 2. So my children, notice he's not speaking to lost people. He's not speaking to people who are, are in darkness. He's talking to people who are walking in darkness that are actually in light. They should walk in light because they have the light in them, but they're walking in darkness. He's talking to children of God. And he says to them, my little children, I'm writing this so that you won't sin. You see, if you walk in light, then it's possible to walk away from sin. But if you walk in darkness, then it is sure that you'll walk away from fellowship. Somebody asked me this morning, is it possible to, to lose salvation? Is it possible to, to lose your relationship? No. But watch this. Your sin causes you to lose fellowship, not relationship. You, you want proof of that? Just look at marriage. <laughs> in, in marriage, the, you, you, don't, you don't get divorced first and then fight. You fight and then, and then you get divorced. And the reason you get divorced is because you've, you have somehow entertained the idea of sin in your life. Because divorce is, come on, say it with me, divorce is sin. Come on, everybody say it with me, divorce is, it's sin. Now, can you be forgiven for it? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean you should go around trying to do it. Divorce is sin. You can certainly be forgiven for it. But watch, when, when people get divorced, it's because they've had years of no fellowship. You, lo- you lose the fellowship before you lose the relationship. And in Christ's sake, he knows we're so messed up, he took relationship out. He said, this one is non-negotiable. If you begin a relationship with me, I'm going to make sure I complete it in you. But don't think that means you can't lose fellowship. 
Let's go back to marriage for a minute. Did you know that in marriage, if you're fighting, then it, it ruins the, the fellowship with God as well? When your marriage is, is not doing well, when you're not doing all you can to be the godly man or woman in your marriage, God stops hearing your prayers. That's scriptural. So breaking fellowship with your wife or husband also breaks fellowship with your father. So if you want to fix this one, fix this one. If you want to fix the relationship with your wife, make sure that you're good with God and then get right with your wife. And God's going to say, look, get right with your wife. And then you and I will be right. So there's this, <clears throat> there's this commandment for us that we're supposed to walk. But you can certainly lose fellowship. But if you sin, the Bible says, we have an advocate, a lawyer with the Father. Who? Jesus Christ, don't miss this, the righteous one. You know, there's only one righteous. The Bible says there's no one righteous, not even one. But then this scripture says, we have an advocate. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, there was no righteous one born of Adam. But Jesus wasn't born of Adam. Jesus was born of God. And the Bible says that you have been born of Adam. But each one of you, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 13, can be born or reborn of God. And so you can leave this idea of not being righteous. You can be considered righteous because you can be considered his son. Verse 2 says, and he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not just ours, but the sins of the whole world. You see, his blood covers the sins of the whole world. There is now only one sin the blood of Jesus cannot cover. And that's the sin of rejecting Jesus as Lord. He is either Lord of your life, and therefore he gives his life freely to you, or you're guilty of killing the only begotten Son of God. There is no sacrifice left for those who say, you know what, I don't need Jesus. So tonight, today I want to ask you a question. Number one, are you covered? The word propitiation means to be covered. It's the idea that when God sees you, it's like NCIS. Anybody watch NCIS? Sinners. See, I can do that because we're all sinners. See, it works. In NCIS, how do they always find out who their man is? DNA. And when God sees you, you know what he sees? He sees the DNA of Adam. And Adam's DNA is guilty. <clears throat> but the Bible says that he wants to cover you with the blood of Jesus, which gives you the appearance of a different DNA. Did you catch that? So that when God sees you, he now sees through the transparent blood of Jesus. He sees not you, but his son. So he can say to you what Jesus should have had said to him, which is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Are you covered? Because you know being covered has nothing to do with how you live. It has to do with who you are. You must be born again. Are you walking in light? Maybe you've been covered with the blood of Jesus, but you're not walking in light. You're not walking in truth. You're walking literally away from truth. You know what you should do, but you're just kind of tolerating darkness. You know, today's the day to turn the light on. Today's the day to say to the Lord, I'm tired of walking in the darkness. I'm tired of walking in my own truth, because my own truth is a big lie. <clears throat> do you have an intimate relationship with Jesus, or are you going through the motions like a bad marriage? I wonder if I asked you about your prayer life, you'd tell me about your, your meals. Everybody catch that? I wonder if I asked you about your prayer life, you'd tell me about all your diseases. Or if I wonder if I asked you about how you're talking to God, you'd say, man, it's been a sweet time. <sighs> me and God have sweet talks. What have you done with the sin that God's revealed in your life? Have you gone and hid it? Or have you confessed it? Not just the sins that you've committed. What about the sins that you've omitted? What about the things you're not doing? So many of us, we, we confess all the things we're doing. I, God, I'm doing this wrong. God, I'm doing this wrong. What about the sin of not spending time with God? Because isn't that the greatest one at this point? Will you make a decision today to live in the light of God's Word? Will you invest time in God's Word so that you can even see what God wants from you? If you only knew the spiritual realities and the spiritual battles all around you, you would spend more time in prayer. Only the light of Christ which comes from the Word can illuminate a spiritual realm around you that you have no idea about. You see, there are pitfalls that you could escape if you would just spend time asking God to reveal them to you. 
We battle not of flesh and blood, but of spiritual principalities that wage war in the heavenly realms. You are in a battle you know nothing about. Because we spend our, we spend our lifetime trying to figure out how to see with these eyes instead of seeing with eyes of faith. So what will you do with the knowledge today you've received? Whatever God's revealed to you today, my, my hope is that you'll obey Him and come back into fellowship with your God. Because watch this. He didn't die on a cross to be my God. And he didn't, it doesn't say, my Father who art in heaven. It says, He's our Father. And today He desires to be yours. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, today can be the day where you become a child of God. It's not by doing anything crazy. It, it, and you don't have to walk up here. Let me give you permission to not come up here. Some of you going, what? Let me give you permission. Because you don't have to come up here to give your life to Jesus. You can do it right where you sit. You can say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I want you to be Lord of my life because I can't do it without you. And the Bible says if you'll do that and call upon his name, you will be saved today. But then the Bible says if you confess that before man, he'll confess you before his father. And so then I want to invite you to come and say, I want this decision to be known by all because I'm not ashamed of the one who died for me. And some of you would say, well, what are the rest of us, why are we supposed to come up here? Well, number one, you can be an example and come and pray. Some of you need to bring your wives up here and ask them to forgive you and come pray over your wives. Huh. Well, that would start revival, amen? See, only the women amen that. Some of you know for a fact the, the, the lies that you're living. And today can be a day of freedom if you'll just let God illuminate it to you and then you confess it today. So I'm just going to ask you to do business with God. If, if you, need to, you want to come and surrender your life to Jesus, I'll be here to receive you. If you want to be baptized, you've never been baptized after giving your life to Jesus, I'll, I'll be here to receive you so we can baptize you in an upcoming week. Maybe you're looking for a church home and you say, well, this pastor's crazy. I'm not, the, I'm not the senior pastor. You'll be all right. He's crazier than me. I'll ask you to come. But I just want you to do business with God today. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, it is my desire God, to be in accordance with your will. Father, I ask your spirit to sweep this place now. Father, bring light to darkness today. Reveal in us the things, the sins that we think no one knows about. Father, would you cause us to be broken before you? Would you call your people to repentance today? Father, if there be anyone here today that they're not positive that you're Lord and Savior of their life, Lord, I pray today would be the day that they run to the altar and say, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I don't want to walk in darkness anymore. And Lord, if there be people here who've given you their lives, but Father, they're not walking in light. They're not walking in truth. They, they have tried to hide and they've not been transparent. They've certainly not been reflectors to a lost world. Lord, today I pray that you would call us all to our knees. That we would honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name.